Uh, hello everyone, my name is Gabriel. Uh, this is Jonah, Mikhail, Ben, and Kelsey. And we're team Firestep, we're team uh, number five. We've been working with Professor Jostun and Professor Kia, and we want to thank them also for the help that they've been giving us this past year. Uh, just to give you an overview of what our project is, uh, the main idea is to build a support vehicle that will be able to assist in the, in the event of emergency. Uh, our vehicle of choice was a quadcopter. We believe that the quadcopter allowed us to fly through the environment without concerning the state of the ground. Um, and part of our requirements was to be able to both fly the copter in autonomous mode. It should be able to navigate a non-mapped area without previous knowledge of uh, the building and fly in manual mode for security reasons. Uh, and, uh, and then we decided to use a thermal image to use a quadcopter to locate people that could be under distress, under stressful situation, or potential danger. Uh, and additionally, we provided an interface for the rescue team to be able to see what the quadcopter has discovered so far. So let me give you a sample scenario so we can understand more or less what we're talking about. There's an earthquake in the building, the rescue team shows up. There's no point in the team to uh, go inside the building if they don't know that there's anyone inside the building. They, they shouldn't risk their lives, put themselves in unnecessary danger. Uh, so they deploy a quadcopter, they put it into the building, goes up, goes inside without any previous knowledge of the building. Uh, it starts navigating using uh, some algorithms that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. And it uses a thermal camera to constantly be looking for people. Whenever it detects a person, it sends a signal to the rescue team with a map of how to get to that person, uh, thereby simplifying the, uh, the work that the rescue team has to do. Um, the final state of the project includes a quadcopter that we will be demoing uh, at four, I believe. Um, it will be demoing in manual mode. Our promise mode is not stable enough to be flying indoors for the room full of people. I mean, safety is a concern. Uh, and we will also be demoing the interface that the rescue team has uh, to interact with the quadcopter. Uh, as I was saying, the autonomous mode is not stable enough because of two main reasons. One of them is the accuracy of our sensors and the refresh rate that our sensors have. Uh, our feedback loops on the quadcopter are running at 50 hertz and our sensors are running at a maximum of 10 hertz. And that's not enough uh, data to fly stably without potentially crashing into things. And uh, we also had issues with the processors that we chose. We chose the boards that we chose were really good at doing what they were doing. But as soon as we started communicating all three boards together, the communication started lagging, uh, which became a pretty big issue. Uh, so just to go over what our project entails, uh, the quadcopter, fully integrated with the system, the Tamar S320, which is a thermal camera that was provided by DRS, uh, an SF02 laser rangefinder, which is a high precision rangefinder. Uh, we use this to traverse down hallways to a little bit more accuracy than just you know, where the walls are next to us, an array of ultrasonic sensors that give us a mapping of where we're standing, the graphical user interface, and the development boards. We have three boards on the quadcopter. We have a um, Eagle Black, a Raspberry Pi, and an Arctic Pilot. Right, now I'm going to let Ben talk about the quadcopter design. Thank you, Gabe. So our quadcopter design was built out of carbon fiber, uh, mostly with some aluminum and PLA plastic. Um, the hardware, as Gabe mentioned before, uh, we had a Beagle Bone and an RD Pilot. The RD Pilot is a control board that has the onboard sensors. And what it allowed us to do was it did a lot of the controls for us. Um, we chose an H frame design because we have a, had a ton of electronics to put all over the place. And so it provided a lot of room to, for us to put all these electronics on there. Uh, we also used uh, 1100 uh, kV motors with a four cell battery. And this allows, and the most efficient propellers for this setup was a seven inch by uh, three blade propeller. What this allowed us to do was to reduce the footprint of our copter so that we could fly through uh, doorways much easier. Um, in terms of safety, we uh, added a foam protection barrier, which we also used to mount uh, all the sensors. And this allowed, um, and this protected uh, people from getting hit with the, pro the propellers. And now I'd like to pass this on to Mikhail to talk about navigation. Thank you, Ben. Um, so one of the requirements of our project is to be able to navigate a floor of a building uh, autonomously with no prior knowledge of the floor plane. Um, so the way we did this with, is with the navigation module, which took in sensor data um, and used that to create a local map of its surroundings. And from that map, it determined where it should go next to fully explore the floor. 
and it would basically follow this process until it is fully explored on um, the entire area. Um, the algorithm behind the mapping is basically a breadth first search that would find all location points that are uh, haven't been explored yet, and then it used a depth first search to recursively go through and explore all those points, and it would basically do this iteratively until all points have been explored, and that means that basically the whole floor has been explored. Um, and this also, the algorithm, uh, the navigation module was also used to give the fire, uh, the rescue workers um, location data about how to find the survivors and the easiest way to reach them. Um, so this is basically a quick demonstration of uh, our simulation for the algorithm. And if you can see on the map there, um, the green line represents how the quadcopter would actually move through the floor plan to explore everything. And now I'll pass it off to Jonah, who's going to talk about image processing. All right, so one of the biggest jobs for our copter is to be able to find humans, and we use image processing for this. Um, we use thermal camera provided by DRS, the Tamra 320, and our choice of algorithm was HOG, the Supergram of Oriented gra uh, Gradients. So the way this works is we give HOG a set of sample images. What it does is it extracts the features, and using these features, um, it passes these features into the SVM, and uh, that classifies the images as positive or negative sets. And after all this is done, we can actually detect humans in real time. And over here, we have three images. Um, the ones on the I guess, foreground is positive detection of humans in different positions. We see Gabe with the arms down, and Gabe with the arms over his head. And the one underneath it is just a blank image. It doesn't have anything in it, and it's not detecting anything. So, positive and negative. And now I should hand it off to Kelsey for our GUI. Shown on this slide and the next are some screenshots that we've uh, provided to give you a visual of our graphical user interface for Fire Scout. Here you can see the primary status tab of the interface, which shows the data that's communicated back and forth with the quadcopter. In addition to this, you can see the logger, um, which keeps track of the data logs during each search mission of the copter. Here, um, two more screenshots from the user interface. You can see the PID tab, which keeps track of tuning parameters that you can interact with uh, to send data to the copter, and also a navigation tab to show the map that is simulated. Also, another important part of the project are the sensors involved. We were lucky enough to be donated the SF02 laser rangefinder by Professor Pisano, which provides a directional accuracy of up to 40 meters. And in addition to this, we have an array of ultrasonic sensors to compensate for the remaining faces of the copter. Now we welcome you to enjoy our video. <laughs> Playing. Well, uh, the video was simply a demonstration of the quadcopter flying, and as I mentioned, we will be flying it uh, during demos uh, at 4 o'clock. Uh, just to conclude our presentation, we want to talk about how we could push this project forward. Uh, we would like to, you, we would have liked to use a 3D laser rangefinder that was simply out of our budget. And what the 3D laser rangefinders allow us to do is have a 3D mapping of the environment you're currently flying in. And that way we wouldn't have to what worry as so much about the refresh rate of the sensors or I keeping our location. Uh, with a 3D laser rangefinder, it's very easy to implement a SLAM algorithm um, that would be a lot more accurate for what we're trying to do. And additionally, we would like to move some of the processing off the board. Uh, maybe Shall send the images to the computer for the computer to analyze them and have that being done locally. That way, we can remove a board from the quadcopter, reduce the quadcopter size, and uh, run at a faster speed. Um, we would also like to thank Oh, yeah. uh, we'd like to thank Professor Max Schweiger of the Mechanical Department for letting us use his lab for testing. And we'd also like to thank uh, Ryan Lacey of Epic for uh, doing some of the machining for us. Yeah. Uh, so we'd like to open the floor for any questions you might have. So I have two questions. Uh, considering your name is Fire Scout, have you guys considered the thermal rating of a lot of these? Yeah. Uh, originally, our goal was to fly in like a fire scenario and be like a, an assistance to the firemen. Uh, but as we started going to the 
product and we realized what exactly we were trying to do, um, we had two big concerns. One of them is doing using a thermal camera to detect people when you're spying around, a little bit useless, uh, right? And then the other concern was the, the dynamic, the aerodynamics inside a place like that are completely different. So the heat, the air density changes, and it would be it'd be a lot of it'd be a very different project. The one we're trying to solve. Not to mention there'd be a lot of different. Uh, it would require different machining. I have to use. Um, I need access to tools that I wouldn't be able to find on this campus. So. Right. Yeah, you have to worry about stuff. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Pretty important. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the things that you talked about, you had like this one. You have this uh, quadcopter flying through a building and doing stuff. Do you have to have the, the computer constantly connected to it? And if you do, like, how do you how do you maintain that connection? So the GUI is completely separate. Um, what you have is you have a wireless connection and it's connected via XP. So it's completely what? I'm sorry? XP. Right. So it's it's a module that allows you. It's a USB interface. You connect to your computer. We can run our module. If you don't actually have it connected, it will tell you you can't use it. So it connects to it completely wirelessly. Okay. And if the, the copper wanders out of reach of my computer, it will most likely uh, it will keep going with the you algorithm. Just won't get readings on your yeah. Just won't get readings until right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so everything's logged, both on the copter and on your side. Awesome. Also, really good job, by the way, actually pointing out the elaborating your customer scenario actually really helped me. Okay. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Um, the SVM algorithm that you used for classification is as good as training data. Uh, yes so and no. Right, so uh, we used a lot of different samples for the training data. We, used, we took pictures using the thermal camera, all of ourselves in very different positions. Uh, sitting down, standing up, doing like weird figures. Uh, and we used for the negative samples, which I believe are a little bit more important, uh, just pictures of hallways of different thermal sources that would be classified as negative. How large was this separate? How large? We had around 120 positives and more than 300. You actually run it to see whether you get positives. Yeah, so we get and so on. Right, so our algorithm is very good at detecting people. It's also sometimes good at misdetections, uh, which was a problem. But sometimes it'll detect something when there wasn't something that didn't draw our secret or anything. Like no, we did not get that far with the SN detector. Uh, so power is a big concern with aerial vehicles. Um, how do you kind of consider that, and how long will the um, vehicle stay in the air? Uh, we used a, uh, a five amp hour battery, um, and we made it four cells to increase the. Originally, we had it at three cells, but um, doing a, a four cell battery uh, drew less current um, through the motors. Uh, we don't have a precise um, calculation as to how long it'll last, uh, at least 10 minutes, though. It really depends on how your throttle is moving and how active you are. Mm -hmm. Hovering is a lot simpler than if you're just changing directions and moving around. Uh, but of course, as the copter got heavier and heavier, so you have components that the battery yeah, yeah. increase. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good time to outside. Is it like a uh, window is open? So yeah, I mean, <laughs> your example was um, I mean, the idea behind it is that if you get basically an area that all sides are open, you'll pretty much think that it's like a big room and has to explore everything. Um, our scenario kind of assumes that, you know, it's a kind of a closed area. Um, so if that were to happen, it would start trying to explore the outside world and find its way around. <laughs> I, would, I would like to add that if we had the 3D laser range finder, it would be very easy to see that we no longer have a ceiling above us or something. Yeah. Right. And right now we're keeping track of the ceiling so that we don't crash into it, but we're not using the <coughs> algorithm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.